What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Wrestling with John. This is a special WrestleMania 36 review. So originally when I planned uh, our guest, we was going to talk about NXT TakeOver Tampa. Of course, that's all out the window. We know what's happened. Coronavirus is impacting on all of our lives. Uh, and I've gone at length on all of the previous episodes of the podcast about the coronavirus and how that's impacted the wrestling world and WrestleMania, WWE in particular. Uh, but I've got Kurt Johansson back on the Wrestling With Jonas podcast. He is the Brock Lesnar of Wrestling with Jonas episodes. He only comes when, when there's a, a big payday and a big, uh, big show to talk about. So, Kurt, brilliant to have you back on the show. How are you, sir? <laughs> really good, thank you. And you know what? I'll take that Brock Lesnar um, <laughs> character, shall we say? Like Lesnar is outstanding, even though he does only turn up a few times a year. And there I'd like go. to think the same of myself. There we go on the rest of Jonas podcast. But to, I see you helped us out with our anniversary edition, our episode 100 edition, which was lots of fun. Uh, and then Wrestle Kingdom night one. Now WrestleMania night one. So uh, we'll have to think of a, another really big event to get you back on the show for. But we're going to be talking about night one, WrestleMania 36. Um, and a, a very different, very unique WrestleMania to what we've experienced now. Me and you, we've spoken before. We kind of grew up WWE or WWF fans. And uh, we've kind of branched out to enjoy other the types of the genres of pro wrestling over the years um i know that you're you're a big fan of, of japanese wrestling and a, a proponent of, of the women's uh, wrestling but wwe still kind of has a, a a special place in your heart i'm guessing and uh you know with wrestlemania going through everything uh it's gone through being a two-night event now uh before no no fans kind of before you saw last night's show where was your kind of head at were you looking forward to it were you not looking forward to it? apprehensive certain matches standing out to you or um you know did it even feel like a wrestlemania before the show turned on last night it's hard to say like wrestling wrestling so i was looking forward to watching it like over the course of the two nights there's some fantastic matches that's been put on but my biggest concern was was the fact there's no fans and things like that going to change some results or change how matches would play out and what they're doing those matches and it did take the feel away from it a little bit um where some stuff i was questioning and was like would they have done that if there was a crowd there yeah. but no I was, I was still looking forward to watching it um <laughs> obviously night one which we'll talk about we had taker and styles which i was really looking forward to um, we had Daniel Bryan and Sami Zayn again, really looking forward to that. Yeah. And then on night two, you've got Edge and Orton and Drew and Lesnar. How can you not be looking yeah. forward to those two matches? Absolutely, absolutely. And we'll uh, touch upon kind of night two's lineup a bit later on. But um, yeah, I mean, let, let's uh, quickly talk about what you've been up to. So you, you're busy with the, the Ringsiders boys and your own podcast, uh, Kurt's Angle. Uh, give us a quick rundown as far as uh, what you've been up to lately. Any plans you have for the future? And I know you've got a bit of exciting news as well. Yeah, well, so still part of Ringsiders. It's a bit difficult due to the current pandemic. A lot of our stuff was face to face where we'd all get together and do it. Um, and I'd been quite busy. So Callum and Jamie had done a few interviews with some guys from N NWA. We had Zicky Dice and Royce Isaacs on the show, so you can check over at the Ringsiders podcast. Callum and Jamie are doing like an offshoot as well called Ringsiders Ranch, where it's a little bit more relaxed and a, not as formal, or they just talk shit basically, which mm. it's fun to see their personalities. So I should eventually get on that. It's just setting up all the logistics and... Like you said, I've been really busy with my own podcast, Kurt's Angle, which I feel these past few weeks have gone strength to strength in terms of viewerships and what I've been doing. Obviously, I kicked things off with uh, my debut episode was an interview with NWA's Thunder Rosa, which you can still check out on my YouTube page. And then I've had a few different sort of themes like discussing AEW and NXT the war so far with the queen i discussed all things nxt japan with jpq from no particular angle and then i started the brit rest isn't dead um series which basically just highlights all the good stuff that's happening in in the uk essentially and i may talk about stuff that goes into europe and yeah, I've just had a few back-to-back -back interviews. I've launched a series called From the Ground Up. I will be speaking to people that are in academies, moving forward, breaking through to the main shows, debuting at other shows, and 
trying to give an insight of what it's like to be a trainee wrestler. So yeah, from the ground up, I'm uh, working in association with Reach with that one so far. And I've got L.A. Taylor and Kyle Parker interviewed so far. And I've also got Aurora interviewed, which hasn't been released and should be released shortly. And then, yeah, check out my other interviews. I've just interviewed Alexis Falcon, one of the best female wrestlers here in the UK. Um, Corey McRae on Turnbuckle TV. And <clears throat> that's some of the exciting news. Kurt's Angle podcast will now be getting its own channel on Turnbuckle TV, which also had some great news that they're partnering with wrestle talk so that's absolutely huge and it's great that we're both on there john yeah yeah definitely yeah really yeah. happy with that and the guys at turnbuckle tv uh they they've been very very supportive and, and excellent for the wrestling with john's podcast and like i said i've dropped a few uh interviews like uh, my interview with Chantel jordan big f in joe uh cj carter um you know in partnership with turnbuckle tv so they really do support uh both of our podcasts very very well and uh, we're very kind of appreciative for everything they've done for the wrestling with john's podcast a couple of things that my listeners will have to look forward to over the coming weeks and like i say we're still uh uh, throwing out uh, well daily podcast at the moment this is uh, one of our five days five podcast episodes of course uh, episode one or five uh, dropped a few days ago when there was myself and uh, mike mad dog angus tnt extreme wrestling rigging out so he dropped on the show to help review a bit of a retro review of wrestlemania 9 so go and check that day two of five we had mags from badland pods and why are you watch and five rounds podcast mags three pods as he's uh, better known on the on the kind of twitterverse and he came on to do a special uh, episode, a uh, WrestleMania edition of the Two Minute Brain Buster Quiz. Uh, yesterday, we dropped uh, our WrestleMania predictions preview episode with uh, Lexi Helms, who does a lot of writing for the WrestleManJohnners.com website. Today, of course, we're speaking to Kurt, night one, WrestleMania 36. Tomorrow, which will be day five of five, uh, five days, five podcasts, we've got uh, Matt Bayliss and uh, top of the leaderboard of the Brain Buster Quiz, Grizz, on the show. And we'll have a three man booth talking about night two of WrestleMania. 36 and we're going to be talking down that card for night two a little bit later on um other guests that i've got coming on the show next weekend our regular uh wrestling with john's episode we've got uh, michael jolly coming on the show to help us run down all the good things in the wrestling world and uh, all the fallout to wrestlemania uh, next weekend, we're also interviewing uh, David and Ant, uh, co-owners, co-promoters from DNA Wrestling over in Suffolk and uh, talking about them and their love for pro wrestling and, uh, you know, how they kind of got involved in becoming promoters, uh, especially with DNA Wrestling. And then the following week, we've got Mr. Warren Hayes, uh, another popular on, on, on YouTube and Twitter. He's going to be dropping on the Wrestling with John's podcast uh, to talk all things pro wrestling. So lots of really cool things to list, listen out for and look forward to on the Wrestling with Jonah's podcast but let's have a, a little look at uh, WrestleMania so we we'll quickly talk about there, w- there was a, an hour's kickoff um, and there was a, a kickoff match um, and that match uh, I, I think they only really got announced Saturday afternoon so it's kind of exclusive kind of middle of the afternoon over here in the UK that uh, Drew Gulak would be facing Cesaro on night one and then night two we got to Liv Morgan versus Natalia I believe which would be taking place tonight um, but uh, Drew versus Cesaro on paper a bit of a dream match uh, but they only gave him about four and a half minutes here. Um, and uh, before I could really get into the action, the, the match kind of ended uh, rather quickly from a, from a no hands airplane spin from Cesaro picked up the win uh, in the kickoff match here. But um, two very, very talented technical wrestlers and uh, probably deserved maybe another you know, five or so minutes, I would say, to really get into the action. Like I said, I barely cut up my pizza and sat down to enjoy the kickoff before they <laughs> uh, closed that match uh, after four and a half minutes with that no hands. Very impressive no hands airplane spin, I've got to say. But uh, did you watch the kickoff and what did you think of this one, Kurt? Yeah, I watched it. I was really disappointed, you know, like I was just chatting to a few of the guys and through the Google Hangouts and was just on about like just how crisp and smooth Cesaro and Gulak was. Mm. Like they was doing some great stuff. Like you said, it was only about four and a half minutes and it deserved a little bit longer. In an hour you could have done a little bit longer and just cut some unneeded stuff. There was a lot of stuff where it didn't do anything for me. Whereas that match could have set the tone for Mania and you know what I think it did with four and a half minutes where some of it was quite questionable yeah yeah but um yeah i enjoyed it for what it was but uh like i say before it really got started and like i say these two are very crisp very smooth technical wrestlers um it was over before you knew it but um 
you know, nice to see them both, dare I say it, on a WrestleMania card, even though it was a kickoff in front of no fans. Uh, but uh, one match I want to, what I want to kind of talk about straight off the bat, we're gonna we're gonna kind of leapfrog all the others and go straight to the main event because this is kind of the match that everybody's talking about and a lot of people were looking forward to going into Mania. Um, and uh, this was a very unique uh, boneyard match with the Undertaker versus AJ Styles. Um, where, where was your kind of mind at before seeing what they presented to us last night? Was this a match you were looking forward to? And, uh, uh, you know, it, when you kind of look at what they gave us compared to, you know, what could have been uh, a, a ring, an in-ring match in front of 80,000 people, um, I, I, I thought they definitely delivered. But before we talk about kind of the highlights of the match, where was your kind of anticipation level for this match in particular? I was really looking forward to it. Um with the title Boneyard, everybody was like talking. It's like, oh, what are they going to do? And I remember saying some to somebody that I work with that I can see it being a buried alive match, but set in a graveyard. And they're just trying to change the name because obviously buried alive is not that PG. Um, yeah. Boneyard is. And if they was doing it that way, because it wasn't a live audience, I was like, oh, they could do so much with this. And I think we got a better outcome than what any other alternative could be, in my opinion. I absolutely loved it. Yeah, I totally agree. They kind of shot it as a little mini motion picture, um, and it went 35 minutes amazingly. It didn't seem that way, but there was a nope. lot of kind of uh, extra things going on. I mean, you obviously opened up with The Undertaker's music and a hearse pulling into this kind of graveyard, boneyard. Um, some uh, druids come out. They pull a coffin out the back. We think it's going to be The Undertaker, but it's AJ Styles laughing his ass off, uh, looking great, looking forward to the match. That that was quite fun. The Undertaker pulled up uh, kind of as the American badass a character um, on his Harley. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that, Taker took the fight straight to uh, AJ. He put his, his hand through the hearse window at one point. That was uh, quite impressive. And if you think back to when others have done that, like uh, uh, Goldberg cut himself up pretty bad in an episode of Nitro many years ago from doing that. And I think The Undertaker did get a bit of a scrape on that one. Uh, the Undertaker... Um, eventually knocks AJ into a pre-dog grave. Then Gallows and Anderson, they come onto the scene along with more druids. Taker quickly takes out and disposes of the druids and then he takes down Gallows and Anderson. Uh, AJ comes back onto the scene, smashing a cinder block across the Undertaker's back and then driving him through a fence or some kind of barn or something. We're not quite sure. Uh, then with the Undertaker uh, appearing quite vulnerable and seemingly kind of struggling to recover, um, you know, AJ, uh, I think he knocks Undertaker into the grave. He gets on a digger um, and he goes to kind of bury the Undertaker essentially with the earth that's in his digger. And then uh, from out of nowhere, uh, the Undertaker stood behind AJ, who are full of life, uh, completely revitalized, a fresh Undertaker. Uh, then they, they fight uh, on the roof of a nearby house, or was it the barn? Not sure. Gallows and Anderson, they reappear. They get beaten down again. Undertaker choke slams AJ off the side of this building. Um, then AJ kind of begs for uh, the taker not to bury him in the grave. Uh, but then one big boot later, AJ crashes into this empty grave. Uh, taker fills the grave full of soil from the digger. And then uh, the Undertaker um, uncovers a headstone with AJ Styles' name on it before getting back on his Harley and driving off. So this was kind of a, you know, a bit of a, a mini motion pitch of the way they shot it. I think that what they did was very effective. It definitely delivered. I like the, uh, the the kind of cameos of the the druids and gallows and Anderson and the vulnerability of the Undertaker uh, towards the end there before uh, before he kind of kind of came from out of nowhere out of the grave standing behind AJ Styles so a little bit of a you know a weird spooky kind of uh, like I say you can't kill a man that's already dead can you Kurt but uh, this was a really fun match a uh, bit of a kind of a horror movie vibe going on here very very similar very reminiscent to the Hardy compound matches that took place in TNA and of course that was kind of produced by uh, by Matt Hardy and, and Jeremy Borash and I kind of got a feeling that Jeremy Borash might have been involved in this match as well but really well produced I enjoyed the hell out of it a great way to close Wrestlemania um, and uh, going back to what I said earlier Kurt I think that had you have had The Undertaker and AJ Styles in the ring for 35 minutes trying to give us a wrestling match, it wouldn't have worked considering how broken down Mark Calloway is. But here, in this setting, the way it was put together, I thought it was perfect. But what about you? Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, 
I think it's the best Undertaker's looked since his matches with Brock Lesnar, personally. I think it was shot brilliantly. It was cheesy, but good in a way. Like, the broken stuff's cheesy, but great. Um, and I think props to Lucha Underground. I think Lucha Underground have changed the face of professional wrestling. They were the first company to be doing all this sort of stuff. Yeah, and very their, true. their whole shows and seasons was like a, a motion picture, apart from when they was in the ring. And it was really influenced Impact Wrestling with um, the broken stuff, with what happened with Sue Young, Rosemary and Ali, and what's going on um, now across there, things they've done with like LAX and stuff. And to see WWE pull it off when the House of Horrors match with Bray Wyatt and Orton didn't work. Mm-hmm. And I didn't like the fact that I'm glad they didn't do what they did, where it's like, you start off there, but it has to end in a ring. I'm glad there was no referee there, and I'm just glad it was just an all-out brawl. Really interesting to see what's going to happen next. Obviously, Styles was buried. The only bit of Styles you could see was his forearm and his hand, like, sticking out the grave. So, I'd like to see them follow up on that, like, what has happened to AJ Styles, and could we be getting, like, a different AJ Styles, or... Mm. What do you think is going to happen with Styles? Well, he's, he's very interesting. I mean, uh, I was part of the discussion thread on the re- thread on the Wrestling with uh, Facebook community page, and there was lots of activity on that last night. But uh, when that match concluded and WrestleMania was off the air, there was some talk about AJ Styles' contracts. Now, I'm under the impression that he signed a new contract not long ago, and I'm, I'm pretty certain that he's looking to uh, finish out his career with WWE. I'm sure they're paying him handsomely, and they've treated him very, very, very well from day one, which you can't say about a lot of independent wrestlers or you know former TNA Impact talent that have come to WWE. But but uh, they've really looked after AJ Styles. I think he's had a really good run there. Um, and although you said he was buried, he wasn't buried in kind of like the sense of, uh, you know, we're going to kind of push you to the bottom of the card. He was really, you know, in a, in a high profile match at a WrestleMania against The Undertaker in, in what was the highlight of the show. Um, but um, I think he's sticking around as far as when will we see AJ next uh, and in what form is yet to be seen. Um, it, it's definitely kind of is that water cooler moment on a Monday morning where people are going to be saying, well, you know, what, what's going to happen with AJ Styles? And it's one of them kind of uh, loose threads that WWE is going to kind of, you know, keep pulling us back to over the next few weeks and months as to see, you know, what, what happens in the future career of AJ Styles. So very, very interesting. Um, but uh, let's have a quick look at the kind of opening match to the main card then, Kurt. So we had yep. the Kabuki Warriors and Nikki Cross going up against Alexa Bliss. Uh, sorry, Kabuki Warriors <laughs> versus Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss. And uh, I thought this was a pretty good opener. I thought this was a pretty solid match. And it was for the WWE Women's Tag Team Championship. So you know, there, there was quite a bit of action in this one. Uh, yeah. You know, I enjoyed a lot of it. You had Kyrie Sane got a close near fall when Bliss was hung up in the corner. She hit like a double foot stomp off the top turnbuckle, um, hitting Bliss in the face and the chest. So that looked pretty good. Uh, the Kabuki Warriors had controlled a bunch of the match for the first eight to ten minutes until Cross got the hot tag. Uh, there, there was some really good action at one point. There was a really close near fall from Nikki Cross, and then Kyrie Sane uh, she kind of rescued the the pinfall attempt with an insane elbow to break up the pin. Uh, Alexa Bliss hit hit a, a twist. Bliss saving her partner and then uh, from an Asuka lock and then Sane dropped Alexa with a spear. Uh, the Kabuki Warriors had another close near fall from like a doomsday device move. That was pretty cool. Uh, but then it was it was Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss. They picked up the win after like a, a net breaker from Cross and another twisted Bliss from, Nikki, uh, from uh, Alexa. On to uh, uh, Kyrie Sane for the pinfall. And we've got new women's champions, champions to kick off WrestleMania last night. So I thought it was a good action-packed match. I thought uh, all four women definitely delivered. And uh, you look, say you've got uh, uh, Asuka, who was kind of screaming at ringside and had a bit of atmosphere when she weren't involved in the match. But some pretty good action here. And I thought that this was a good wrestling match to kick off WrestleMania. And we've got new champions as well. But uh, what were your impressions of this one then, Kurt? I really enjoyed it. Um, I said, could that be one of the best women tag title matches there's been? Yeah. Um, I think it's in one of the questions. I really liked it. I think it was dampened by the Twisted Bliss hitting the legs of Kairi Sane rather than the body. Yeah. Um, Kairi did sell it, though. She did sell it well. Yep. Oh, no, she did, like, fantastically. And 
I think the full match was great. Nikki Cross looked absolutely brilliant. Mm. And yeah, history was made. First two time tag team champions for the women's division. There we with go. the blessing Nikki Cross. And it's interesting to see what will happen with Kari Sane and Asuka. There's a lot of rumours, especially with Kari Sane potentially going back to stardom um, in Japan when her, cause her contract's due up shortly. Not sure what will happen with Asuka, but I can't imagine either of them are overly thrilled in what they're doing at the moment. So I wonder what's going to happen there. I, I would just like... WWE to build a tag team division and not just throw loads of people together but organically build some teams and I know it's hard because they barely do that with the men's tag division but that's what I'd like going forward whilst I've got this chance to build people and utilise people because there's no crowd and you can do the experiment build some tag teams yeah yeah no I really enjoyed this match and like say I thought they could have done a bit more when you had the you know the Iconics as champions not that they're great wrestlers but I thought they were you know they were underutilized as champions you barely saw them on TV and they held the the titles for what 120 days but uh, you barely saw them in that four months um, but uh, yeah good for Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss two times champions be interesting to see I'm, I'm in agreement with you I'd like them to do more with more teams in the women's tag team division and really kind of shout about it and, and get them defending the championships on NXT or NXT UK and kind of do what they say they were going to do at the very beginning but uh, a nice little way to kick off WrestleMania there. Then we had the, the great liberator, Sami Zayn, who tells us that he's walking in as Intercontinental Champion and he's walking out as the champion after his match with Daniel Bryan. We'll talk about that match very soon. And then we had a, a match that I don't think many people were looking forward to going into it, but, uh, it, you know, it was probably better than we were anticipating. And that was Elias versus King Corbin. Now, uh, I've got to admit, I've not seen many Elias matches because I don't think he's been in the ring much. He's been more of a comedy character on the outside, strumming his guitar. The past two WrestleManias, he's had like a, a little bit of a, a confrontation with John Cena. We kind of semi-expected to hammer for them to have a proper match at Mania this year. But uh, Elias has been more of a... Uh, a comedy character with his guitar. King Corbin, he was the one who were uh, unpopular uh, as, as it was retired Kurt Angle at last year's WrestleMania. Um, so, you know, there was an angle that played out before this match started where Corbin demanded that the referee raise his hand in victory with a forfeit win after Elias was thrown off the perch at the PC a couple of SmackDowns earlier. Uh, but you know, Elias did stagger out to the ring, managing to smash his guitar over the back of King Corbin. Uh, the match did get underway with Corbin delivering uh, a, a, a deep six to Elias and uh, throwing Elias' shoulder first into the ring post as well. But after a bit of back and forth, uh, we got a roll-up victory for Elias uh, and uh, even some pretty cool uh, entrance or exit music for Elias. Normally he's playing himself to the ring. We haven't really heard much uh, kind of music otherwise apart from uh, Elias's strumming of his guitar. But that was pretty cool to hear some music for Elias after his uh, victory. And um, yeah, this match went nine minutes and it could have been a lot worse than it actually was. Uh, but both wrestlers kind of uh, put on a kind of a, a fairly good WrestleMania match, but uh, give us your thoughts on what went down here. I can't imagine you were too excited when this match was announced, <laughs> but uh, it was probably better than we anticipated. Um, Elias is fantastic. I just wish to do more with him. Although I'm not the biggest fan of Corbin, I think he's one of the best heels in the yeah. business at the moment, um, and I don't think he gets the credit he deserves. Probably from myself either, to be honest. But I saw. The beginning of the match, I didn't see the end of the match. I started pottering around and doing some stuff around the house. Um, so I can't really comment too much on theirs. I just, I wasn't interested in it. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's just one of those where I think just seeing Corbin have about 50 matches with Roman Reigns is just... So would you want him? Yeah. It's just made me fatigued on Corbin. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And uh, like you say, I'm, I, I have to go on record and say that I can't remember one other single match that Elias has had before this one. I've got to be honest with you. He may have had a, an intercontinental title match, I, I think probably on a pay-per-view and lost. Uh, but going back a couple of years ago, WrestleMania 34, and I was there and I witnessed it. And you, you had two individuals, you know, that were massively over with the fans in the arenas, down Bourbon streets. And they were all singing, you know, happy Rusev day and walk with Elias. And that was kind of the opportunity. That was the moment where Elias was kind of white hot and they kind of didn't really do much with and was pushing him as this kind of comedy character. 
Um, but um, yeah, and, and his kind of popularity has cooled off a hell of a lot. But I'm glad to see he got the win here. Maybe that signs of uh, good things to come for Elias. But uh, yeah, it was what it was. Uh, then we had a match that uh, I was quite surprised to see so early into the card. But it was Becky Lynch versus Shayna Baszler for the Raw, Raw Women's Championship. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got to say the build to this one was pretty good, Kurt. You know, uh, they certainly demonstrated Shayna Baszler as this dominant monster heel coming in from NXT as, as the previous two-time champion there of course uh, she had a really good show in at um, uh, the uh, TLC pay-per-view to cap off 2019 um, as kind of the person standing aloft um, closing off that show their last pay-per-view of 2019 she had an excellent show in at this year's Women's Royal Rumble I think she was only in the Rumble for about four and a half minutes but eliminated eight wrestlers uh, before she was eliminated for Charlotte Flair to win the match and then uh, Shayna Baszler had a very very dominant Elimination Chamber back in March, where she pretty much destroyed the competition there. So she's been kind of uh, pushed as this monster dominant heel going into this one. Um, the Becky Lynch, she turns up to the match in like a 14-wheeler truck. That was pretty cool. Uh, but uh, one thing that stood out was seeing Baszler and Lynch kind of pose into an empty arena, doing their usual uh, ring entrances when they were being introduced and kind of showing off the belt and climbing up the turnbuckles and you know, I, I was thinking, couldn't these two wrestlers or any of the wrestlers do something different to reflect the times and do something different to reflect that there's nobody there to pose to? But they did their same entrances, their same introductions, their same poses, which I thought was a little bit odd, to be honest with you, and uh, not really kind of uh, reflective of the current times, there being nobody there. But did, did you notice that at all? And kind of have you got any thoughts on, on the wrestlers doing their same ring entrances and routines before the matches? No, I didn't really notice as much to be honest. Um, I was. You mentioned it. There was such a great build to Becky Lynch and Shayna. Yeah. Like it was absolutely fantastic, and it was just. I kind of see why it was so low down in the card now. Yeah. I didn't think, like what they did in the ring was it was okay, a bit sloppy here and there, um, but very snug with some of the shots. I was just disappointed with how they ended it. Yeah, well, let's quickly get into that because I have to say, I think Shayna was, you know, reasonably strong throughout the whole match. I think she did kind of have the lion's share of the offense. They went to the outside and Shayna swung Becky into the ring announce desk uh, twice head first. That looked pretty painful. Uh, prior to that, I think um, Shayna had Becky in the Carafuda clutch, but uh, Becky was kind of on the ring apron. Then the match went to the outside. They did the desk spots and then they went back into the ring. And after Becky had a kind of head smashed against the ring announce desk uh, twice, um, you would expect the match to be pretty much over. Shayna hooked on the Carafuda clutch for a second time, but Becky kind of rolled back and put in a full face, uh, full force onto Shayna. And, uh, you know, very similar spot to Bret Hart and Roddy Piper for WrestleMania 8, you could say, in a similar spot. Uh, the referee counted to three. The match was over and Becky Lynch kind of stole the victory, really. Um, but, yeah, I was very, very shocked and disappointed that they didn't put Baszler over, considering how strong they pushed her prior to the match and what, how dominant she was during the match. And then it kind of ended in a fairly cheap way, to be honest with you, Kurt. Yeah, I don't know if it's a case of trying to save it for a live audience or if it was just something they planned were. To me, it's as if, they were setting up loads of different stuff, what they can do in the future. Yeah. And I, I just, I was disappointed. Like I said, she was a killer going into it. And she was looking like that. But uh, for something so cheap, I'm, I'm not too sure if they'd have done that if they did have the live crowd. I, I don't want to speculate in that. I just think it could have gone for a little bit longer. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, but it's nice to see that Becky got that year title reign. I think long title reigns aren't as frequent now. I can see Shayna and Becky having another match, maybe a cage, and that's where Shayna could take the belt. Um, yeah. But if Shayna doesn't win, then who? Who's good enough? Because Becky's run through the full roster, and then you've had Shayna Baszler, who's gone through NXT's roster come up and gone through the raw roster on well elimination chamber yeah and now she's just been pinned like that yeah 
Exactly. And something did cross my mind uh, after the finish of this match. And I know that they've been really pushing Shayna Baszler. Uh, we spoke about it earlier, you know, in the Rumble and Elimination Chamber and TLC. But she's not been getting the crowd response. And I know Vince McMahon, he kind of trusts his gut when it comes to things like this. And if you're not getting the crowd response, you're not kind of getting over, um, no matter how much they do with you and how much they push you, they kind of, you know, they, they, they call the Jets on certain individuals. And maybe they thought it wasn't quite the right time because, you know, maybe she wasn't clicking with Vince or maybe, you know, that the crowd response was quite dampened when she has been uh, on a WWE pay-per-view. So maybe they thought that the time wasn't right for Shayna. And uh, let's hope that they do give her other opportunities. As you mentioned, you know, a cage match between her and Becky would be pretty sweet. Um, but so I am kind of wondering whether they soured a little bit on Shayna because of the crowd response uh, or the lack of crowd response that she's received in previous pay-per-views. But uh, let's move on anyway, Kurt. So we had another championship match here. Daniel Bryan versus Sami Zayn. I've got to be honest with you, for, for kind of in-ring action, this is probably the match I was most looking forward to. Uh, we had Yes Chance from the Gronk and Mojo up on the perch. Uh, Daniel Bryan was accompanied to the ring by Drew Gulak. Sami Zayn was led down to the ring by Cesaro and Nakamura. Now, this was, you know, one of, as I said, one of the better matches I was looking forward to going into it but there was lots of shenanigans on the outside and I found that it was kind of slightly overbooked and quite a bit of interference that the match didn't really need to be honest with you. I kind of understand it uh, with Sami Zayn playing kind of the, the chicken shit heel champion uh, you know there was one spot a, a dive through the ropes from Daniel Bryan uh, sent it both himself and Sami Zayn very very hard into the guard railings but didn't seem to affect Daniel Bryan too much he was fine after that move the action was pretty snug in this one, though. Daniel Bryan especially, definitely laying in the, the, the kicks pretty snugly and, and some punches. You definitely heard them on camera. Uh, with no fans being there, you can kind of hear the impact of a lot of these moves a lot more. But uh, there was more shenanigans from Nakamura and Cesaro on the outside. Bryan comes off the top rope only to be uh, caught with a, with a big boot or maybe it was a, a modified halluva kick from Sami Zayn. Zayn hooks the leg gets to one, two, three in a rather quick and surprising finish. As I said, it kind of all leads into Sami Zayn's kind of heel character, kind of relying on the outside interference from his cronies. Uh, but for what it was, it was, it was a fairly good match. Um, I would have preferred another five minutes from these two without as much interference from the outside. I think both of these two are definitely very capable to have a good 10 minute match, um, you know, just using their wrestling ability. But I think it is more of a storyline match, to be honest with you, setting up a, a rematch, I'm sure, of sorts somewhere down the line. But uh, uh, Sami Zayn retains his championship. He's still the IC champion. Um, and uh, yeah, give us your thoughts on this one then, Kurt, and how it all broke down. I was similar to you. I said this match could be the match that steals the show. And it was. I understand why they didn't go like all out. It doesn't go with the story, like you said. Yeah. With um, with Sami Zayn, he plays the chicken shit heel so well. Like throughout yeah, that does. match, you just want in, you want him to get his comeuppance, and I think it's rare that they've done that. And I think if you did go to the match that you and I both wanted, then you start going from. I'm really, I get really annoyed with Sami Zayn to, oh yeah, Sami Zayn is actually really good, and then start with the essentially both these guys chance. So I think they've done a really good job in turning somebody that everybody would cheer because of his in-ring resume to then make it so he's that chicken shit because it's like, oh come on, we know you're so much better than this, and I think it worked really well. Um, and it was good to see Sami Zayn get the defence as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think he's uh, uh, he fits the bill as a you know intercontinental champion, and uh, he, he obviously takes takes pride in being the champion. And uh, I think the longer he has the belt, the better. I think because we're just going to get some you know really really good uh, storylines, some good character development, some good matches down the road. And uh, I, I I've always been a fan of the the, the heels big Ric Flair fan growing up um, and he was much the same you know he'd do anything to kind of get the victory uh, but I'm interested to see where this leads down the line um, I like the alliance that uh, Sami Zayn has with Nakamura and Cesaro at least it's giving them something to do um, but uh, yeah I'd say if they can continue feuding with Daniel Bryan and Drew Gulak that's all good as far as I'm concerned you've got five of the best there kind of involved in this ongoing storyline um, and uh, yes please I'll have more of that but um, there was another championship match we need to talk about and it did kind of change over the last seven or ten days. And it was for the SmackDown tag team titles. So originally it was going to be a three-team ladder match 
for the SmackDown Tag Team Championship. She obviously had uh, the Usos, Jimmy and Jay, going up against current champions, John Morrison and The Miz, and uh, the New Day, Kofi Kingston and Big E. And there we've all heard the stories of why Roman Reigns wasn't a part of WrestleMania 36 and The Miz turned up sick. The Usos kind of was annoyed by this, took exception of this, and then Roman Reigns decided that uh, he'd had enough. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's got, how did he describe it, immune compromise or his, uh, his immune system is compromised because of his previous battles with leukemia so he decided that he wasn't going to take the risk so Roman Reigns left and with the Miz not being included in the match because of him feeling unwell during the recordings it was changed to just a, 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 a kind of a, a three-man ladder match for the tag team title it's a bit of a unique match we had Jimmy Uso, John Morrison and Kofi Kingston this was one of the matches of the night I and mean, we, we spoke earlier about The Undertaker and AJ Styles Daniel Bryan, Sami Zayn, I think this can definitely be held up there in fairly high regard. There were some pretty stiff bumps that all three took in the match. Uh, Kofi got dumped to the outside by Morrison and Jimmy after doing some sort of spring, springboard dive through uh, the ladder. That was pretty impressive. Uh, Kofi comes flown off the ropes, catching Morrison with a reverse Rana off the ladder. So that was pretty good. Uh, then uh, Kofi launches a ladder at Jimmy as he was running across the, the crowd barrier. Uh, that was pretty brutal. And then we had a, a complete kind of rope walk from John Morrison, like a tightrope walk from one uh, top turnbuckle to another, culminating in a beautiful Spanish fly on Kofi. Uh, Jimmy Uso then followed this up with a big frog splash onto the two down below. Uh, Jimmy then gets tipped off the ladder down into the hard floor on the outside. And that was a pretty hard bump, but I can't help but feel that there might have been a crash mat there. And there were the, uh, they could put the camera back on. Uh, there was no crash mat involved, but uh, it looked it looked good uh, for what we saw of it anyway. Um, and then the end of the match because in a rather unique scenario, you had all three wrestlers fighting out um, over the bouts on top of the, uh, the ladders that were set up in the centre of the ring. All three of them, uh, all three individuals had their hands on the title belts. Then uh, Jimmy gives Morrison a huge headbutt, causing John Morrison to fall backwards uh, down onto one of the ladders that was kind of set up in a bit of a, a bridge formation down below. Uh, but Morrison kind of came away with uh, one of the belts in his hand. The other one fell onto the floor, uh, managing to retain the championship for Miz and Morrison. So they're still the SmackDown Tag Team Champions. I thought this was a hell of a match. This some really good action. Um, I thought all three delivered. And I... I probably gave us a better match than we would have had before. Uh, but uh, give us your thoughts on this ladder match then, Kurt. It was my favourite in-ring match of the night. Um, I think, not including Boneyard, this was my match of the night. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Um, the bumps that we got were incredible. Like They didn't hone it in whatsoever. and I didn't know regarding The Miz. I didn't know he turned up not feeling well and that's why Roman pulled himself. And yeah. Yeah, I never knew any of that, so that's interesting. But, yeah, to the match, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. The way, like, Morrison got the win was so, so well done. I thought that was fantastic as well. And I'd love to see uh, Jimmy Uso, like, singles run, personally. Like, it's frustration that they've never done it when one of them's been injured. But I always thought it be like a really good like IC US champion. Yeah, good point. Having like high quality, like important singles matches with people like Brian, Zayn, Owens and stuff. I think he'd be able to put both of them would be able to put on a great show. But for me, Jimmy stands out a little bit more than Jay. Um I know that's weird considering the twins, but hey it happens. Um yeah, so I really liked Jimmy Uso showing in this and I'd love to see bit like the briscoes in ring of honor like you always thought they'd just be a tag team and then when jay did his solo run he was one of the best ring of honor world champions i've had and i'd love to see jimmy Uso do some solo solo stuff especially during this time where again like i said you can experiment just give him these good opportunities to showcase himself yeah, definitely. And I think it really worked having the added element of the ladders. Uh, it looks like three of the six best workers that I could have chose from, from the, uh, the six people in the originally involved in the, the matches. And, and uh, yeah, I'm uh, glad for John Morrison. And uh, he's not been featured too much since he's returned from his kind of... Uh, 
uh, exploits around the world, Lucha Underground, Impact, and various others. But um, I, I, I think that his partnership, his team with the Miz, um, you know, has only got the legs for maybe another three or four months, and then I think they need to go their separate ways. Maybe a feud with one another. Um, but I thought all three individuals did really well and definitely delivered. Uh, I'd, speak- I'd have them. Well, I'd have them continue. I'm really liking it. Like last night, I was sat just having a drink, going Miz and Morrison. Hey, hey, ho, ho. <laughs> Just dancing around the living room going, Miz and Morrison. Hey, hey, ho, ho. I, I, I love both of them. Too. I really do. And yeah. I'd they, like they, to they're see They're pretty them. entertaining. Yeah. I'd like them to stick together for a little bit just because if they split up, then all you've got again is New Days versus us. Yeah. Yeah, good point. And they have added uh, a lot of freshness to the tag team division on SmackDown in particular. Uh, I'm enjoying them as a team. I like uh, all the comedy stuff. They just uh, put out a rap video as well. And, uh, you know, they're not afraid to kind of send themselves up as as kind of comedy characters to get the storyline over. Uh, But uh, I'm really pleased with John Morrison. Great to see him back in WWE. And he seems to be having a hell of a time, really enjoying himself there. Um, And it seems to have revitalized uh, The Miz as well to a certain degree. But I can only see that partnership going for so long but um yeah long may they continue being the champions as it stands at the minute good match last night um then in uh, another really good match we had the, the monday night messiah seth rollins uh coming out looking like jesus christ uh, himself the reincarnation the second coming uh going up against kevin owens there were these two they, they seem to be feuding for months now to be honest with you mostly in kind of tag matches involving you know, samoa joe and murphy and aop and street profits and one of one or two others but i think this is their first proper singles match kind of during this whole build during this whole kind of storyline uh they do seem to have been feuding for a long time now but uh, this was a really competitive match and it kind of did seem to get better and better the longer the match went uh Rollins uh, delivers a buckle bomb um but before he can deliver a, a, a curb stomp Owens transitions into a pop-up power bomb gets a two count from that uh, the match then goes to the outside where Seth uh, cracks Owen over the top of the head with the ring bell. Um, and then that, that, the referee calls for a DQ finish, giving the the, the win to Kevin Owens um, in a fairly unexpected end to the match. Or so we thought, Kurt, uh, Owens cuts a promo in the ring on Rollins uh, to get back into the ring to restart the match under no DQ, no rules match. Uh, the match restarts with uh, Seth driving the, the ring steps into Owens on the outside, following up with a couple of uh, chair shots. Uh, Owens then recovers, delivers a couple of bell shots, ring bell shots uh, of his own to the head of Rollins. Rollins is laid out on the the ring announce desk. Uh, Sorry, Owens is laid out on the ring announce desk. Um, No, it's Rollins, isn't it? And then Owens kind of climbs to the the back of the the Tron um, up onto near the WrestleMania sign above the Tron and delivers an almighty kind of elbow Mm -hmm. from a good 15, 20 feet up and uh, smashing both himself and Seth Rollins through the announce desk. Now, I thought what was really kind of quite worrying and impressive was how Rollins was was selling it. He was selling it as if he couldn't breathe. He was really struggling to catch his breath. But uh, Kevin Owens, he, he got him back into the ring um, and uh, hits a stunner and picks up the win. So uh, this was a match of two halves, really, Kurt. But I, 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 they had a great kind of kind of wrestling match for the first half. The second match was a little bit uh, more of a, a no DQ, no rules match. And uh, that's a dive off of the kind of the top of the Tron underneath the WrestleMania sign onto uh, Rollins down below and how they both sold it. Um, I thought it was a, a really good match and uh, it didn't go too long either, but um, uh, yeah, nice, a really good memorable match between these two. And that's a, a bit of a WrestleMania memory, a bit of a moment, a bit of a highlight package uh, moment there, that dive off of the screen. But uh, what's your thoughts on what went down here? I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. When the first part of the match, I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I thought, you've done this with Becky and um, and Shayna. Now you're doing it with these two. Like, where you're just doing a cheap finish just to do it down the road again. Yeah. Um, but then it turns out Kevin Owens has the power to book himself another match on the grandest stage of them all. Um, so it was nice that WWE kept that time spare just in case Owens did want to do whatever <laughs> he wanted to do. But no, apart from that, I really did enjoy it. Um quite disturbed with some of the, some of the selling from Rollins like there's some weird noises coming out there oh yeah um, <laughs> I was concerned for him <laughs> yeah um but I thought it was it was a good brawl I enjoyed it it's good that Kevin Owens finally got that win um it'll be interesting where they'll go with the Monday Night Messiah now um it'll be interesting with that 
But yeah, Kevin Owens, what a bump. Like he puts his body on the line. He's he's had so many memorable moments so far as well. And it'll be good to see where's next for Kevin Owens. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't think there'll be many kind of uh, shots of WrestleMania 6 appearing on any kind of uh, WrestleMania highlight packages, but uh, this particular dive and the elbow drop uh, down onto Seth Rollins through the desk will definitely be part of their WrestleMania moment highlight reels for sure. Uh, then we had a bit of a comedy segment between Mojo um, and R Truth and the Gronk, who is, of course, the WrestleMania host. You had R Truth, the current 24 7 champion. Uh, the Gronk knocked him to the ground, uh, goes to pin R Truth. Mojo pulls the Gronk off of our truth and uh, uh and uh, pins our truth himself to become i don't know the, the two time the four time 10 time 24 7 champion i don't know how many times mojo has won it but uh, that's going to set up a little bit of a confrontation between the gronk and mojo possibly something on night two there and then uh, the last match to talk about uh, was another match that was changed. We've had a few matches on the WrestleMania card that's changed because of COVID-19 or injuries or one or two things. Um, but uh, Braun Strowman was Roman Reigns' kind of last-minute replacement. It was announced on SmackDown only the night before on Friday, and he was going to be going, going up against uh, current Universal Champion Goldberg. So, uh, yeah, I, I was kind of surprised that this match didn't go on last, but then when we saw what we had in the form of The Undertaker and AJ in the Boneyard match, I kind of understood why. And I also understood why when uh, you look at the, the kind of the clock and how quick this match ended, you had, I think, three spears from Goldberg on Strowman. Uh, Strowman hit back with, with four running power slams um, and uh, pinned Goldberg in two minutes, 10 seconds to become the new Universal Champion. So we've spoken before. I'm sure we've had conversations about Strowman and how they've kind of <laughs> missed their opportunities with Strowman in the past and how, uh, you know, Strowman, they, they should really have struck when the iron was hot with Strowman, but they dropped the ball with him on so many occasions. This was probably his fourth or fifth attempt at a uh, Universal Championship. Um, um, but uh, what they gave us was uh, not too painful. It only went a couple of minutes. It was quick. It involved, what, seven or eight moves, and it was done. Um, and uh, we've got a new Universal Champion. But uh, talk us through your thoughts on this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, they've just they've done it, haven't they? They've made it so nobody cares about Strowman. He was the hottest thing in wrestling at one point, and now yeah. nobody cares. And it's like, oh, yay, Strowman's champion. And that's the first time he's won it. And that shouldn't be the reaction. But it's just because it was no build to it, which obviously with Roman, um, obviously Roman was going to take the title. But, like, I don't know. I've, what are they going to do with Strowman as champion that will make us care about him? Yeah. Because nine times out of ten, caring about a champion is his journey to the title. But they've just hot shot that jumped in front so why are we going to care for him now because what are they going to do with him i don't know i i I, it wouldn't surprise me further down the line i mean looking ahead to when things are back to normal relative normal uh, normality and uh, they've got fans in arenas we could potentially be looking at a SummerSlam match between braun Strowman and roman reigns and they could i mean they're obviously not interested in turning Roman Reigns heel, but they've got an opportunity here to turn Strowman heel and have him kind of brutally attack Roman and get some heat on himself. And that could be relatively interesting. So, you know, that could be the way I think they're possibly going with this one. Um, I'm glad they've taken the belt off of a part-timer, obviously a transitional champion. I think everybody was up in arms when they took the, the belt off of the Fiends um, just for kind of Goldberg to have his WrestleMania moment with Roman Reigns. We know that that's all changed and Strowman's now the champion. Uh, was it really worth it in the ends? We don't know, but uh, at least I don't think the fiend as a character needed the championship anyway. To be honest with you, um, I think he's better as you. He's one of them characters that doesn't really need a title to be over. And we'll see uh, kind of uh, the fiend go up against John Cena on night two. But I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm pleased in one sense that they've given the belt to Strowman finally, um, and that it, it you know I. I 
I'm just glad that it's not on Goldberg and it's back on kind of somebody as a full time performer on the roster more than anything. And that they've finally given it to Strowman after so many false starts, to be honest with you. Although it was obviously further down the kind of plan list, further down a pecking order than they had originally envisaged, um, because Strowman wasn't going to be part of the, the, the card at all. And here he is picking up the gold. But uh, it was what it was. Only went two minutes, 10 seconds. Um, and then, of course, like I say, we finished last night's show with the Boneyard match, which is the match we opened up with at the top of the podcast so it was it was definitely a very unique very interesting wrestlemania and obviously it's been split over two nights for reasons um but um do you think night one of wrestlemania 36 delivered um and what 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 if anything would you have done differently or maybe changed about the night or maybe some of the matches to have made it come across better as, as a presentation as a product last night um becky and shana out of changed um, I think they're both capable of such a better match. Um, there's not much you could do with Goldberg and uh, Strowman other no. than what they already did. It was as good as could be uh, that match, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It what it wasn't terrible. Like I did enjoy bits of it. Um, and I'm thankful that WWE and everybody on the roster are putting their health at risk to still entertain us. Like. WWE have taken such a financial hit on WrestleMania not happening for a live audience. So props to them for not cancelling and rearranging and giving something for us all to watch during these tested times. So all props to that. I'm looking forward to night two. I hope there's more decisive conclusions in the matches than there is was uh, than there was for um, night one. But yeah. yeah, I'm interested to see what happens with AJ Stark. Well, all three of them. Obviously, Styles got buried alive. Gallows got kicked off the roof. And Anderson more or less got burnt by all the pyro. Yeah, and I think he got uh, tombstone for his troubles on, on the roof of that uh, building. But uh, and, and going back to that main event, it, it was a, a very good way to close out last night's show and I think it, had it been just a normal match between Taker and Styles in the ring would have got fans or no fans it probably would have been a flop to be honest with you but uh, with the way they it produced, saved the show yeah it definitely saved the show and uh, I mean highlights for me I definitely loved that main event the Boneyard match um, I was I really enjoyed the, the ladder match as well I think they yeah. really delivered on that uh, Kevin Owens versus uh, Seth Rollins and Daniel Bryan versus Sami Zayn were very good I enjoyed the opener as well the women's tag match um, uh, the Kabuki Warriors versus uh, Bliss and Nikki Cross I thought that was very good so some, some good matches I don't think there was a dud uh, on the card to be honest with you and they obviously had time to put these matches together and to edit them and make them look a bit better and they only had so much to work with when you've you know not got your 80,000 people in the Raymond James Stadium as we were expecting it was a very very unique night indeed but uh, looking at night two's matches and very very briefly then Kurt um, you've obviously got a, a kickoff match that was announced yesterday Natalia versus Liv Morgan uh, you've got uh, the women's championship match for Smackdown Bailey going up against uh, Naomi Tamina Lacey Evans and Sasha Banks you've obviously got the Street Profits putting their raw tag team titles up uh, on the line against Angel Garza and Austin Theory and Austin Theory uh, replacing Andrade of course who's out injured uh, one match I'm particularly looking forward to uh, is Otis versus Dolph Ziggler I don't mind saying I'm a big Otis fan I really want to see uh, uh, how that kind of storyline progresses on WrestleMania tonight. I've really enjoyed. That's probably one of the been one of the better, more uh, intriguing uh, and more fun builds to any of the matches that we've uh, seen at WrestleMania. You've got Alistair Black versus Bobby Lashley, of course. One match I'm really intrigued by. We spoke about the the Boneyard match and this match will have a similar kind of uh, movie style movie theatrical sort of theme and that's going to be John Cena versus The Fiend uh, you've got Charlotte Flair versus Rhea Ripley for the NXT Women's Championship Randy Orton versus Edge I mean come on that's going to be an amazing match and with it being a last man standing match who knows they could fight all around the PC outside the PC they could fight into the into the road and into the street I mean it, that could be a wild one most definitely and then of course you've got the match which is going to close the show I'm assuming Brock plays no WWE champion going up against Drew McIntyre and hopefully that'll be Drew McIntyre's kind of crowning moment there's a WWE Chronicle documentary out on Drew McIntyre at the moment uh, basically you know in, in the midst of all the news breaking about the coronavirus him nearly getting stranded in Scotland not being able to make it back to the States and 
having the realization that WrestleMania is going to take place before no fans, but then he realizes he's still got the opportunity uh, to to make you know make his dream come true after um, all the scratching and clawing he's done to get into the position he's in. But uh, night two looks pretty tasty, and knowing what we know now about how WrestleMania is going to look and feel, um, I think some of these matches could um, be you know uh, talk worthy or newsworthy the following day. Then Kurt, but to any matches on night two that you're really looking forward to. The Edge and Orton, Edge and Orton match I'm really looking forward to. I think Lesnar and McIntyre could do some great stuff together. Cena and Fiend is going to be fantastic. Mm. Rhea Ripley and Charlotte, they could have an absolute clinic, um, which I'm hoping they will to make up for the lacklustre Becky Lynch and Shayna Baszler. Yeah. I think it's it's definitely the stronger of the two shows and I'm hoping they do something real bizarre with the Firefly Funhouse match. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. And yeah, again, it, it, I, I use this word a lot, experiment, and I think they did that with Styles and Taker, and it worked. So could we finally get that Taker and Sting match? Oh, now you're talking. Now you're talking because uh, obviously we know that Taker, he's, he's kind of uh, seen better days, same for Sting, but in an environment like that, uh, when I was listening to Dave Meltzer's podcast, uh, Wrestling Observer newsletter, uh, with um, uh, Brian Alvarez this morning, and they were saying that in that sort of setting, The Undertaker could carry on for many more years, exactly. uh, as opposed to having in-ring matches, which um, looks you know, dodgy at best, but um, yeah, no, you've kind of got my mind racing there, but that could definitely work. And I'm sure you're probably not the only person that's kind of thought of that idea. I'm sure the, the, the minds behind WWE are kind of have already thought about the possibilities of future Boneyard matches, but um, Kurt, it's been fantastic to have you back on the guest at the Brock Lesnar of the Wrestling with Jonas <laughs> podcast uh, on for his fourth uh, fourth occasion. But uh, thank you so much, Kurt, for being a, a very special guest and uh, a great contributor to uh, this podcast episode, uh, WrestleMania 36, night one. Uh, but uh, just for all of my listeners, I want to reach out to you and say hi, hear more about uh, what you're doing with Kurt Angle's pod and so many other things. Where can they find you on social media, uh, on, on Twitter or wherever else you are? So you can find me at Kurt Sangle Pod. You can talk to me personally as well on Twitter at Kurt Johansson 93 Again, I'm still over at Ringsiders Pod as well. So across all three of those, you can get to me really. But Kurt Johansson 93 or Kurt Sangle Pod, if it's directly me that you want to speak to, that's probably the best. And that's where you'll find all the upcoming stuff. So I mentioned what at the beginning of the show, what I've got out there so far. Again, I mentioned Aurora, so the third episode of From the Ground Up will be getting released shortly. Um, I'm just waiting on some new stuff. Like I mentioned, I'm on Turnbuckle TV now. However, my audio will be debuting on a network shortly. Um, So my next episode will be an interview with the professional Nathan Cruz, um, an absolute fantastic chat, good friend of mine. And that will be my debut episode on the chair shot radio network oh very good very so, good yeah go. fact, you can find me on there and yeah just drop me a message cool well thank you again kurt and uh, i'm sure we'll have you on the podcast somewhere down the line where there's a, a big and important show to talk about but uh, <laughs> thank you once again my friend i really appreciate everything you do uh you know when, when you're on these episodes but uh, please keep it tuned to the wrestling with Jonas podcast of course we've got uh, wrestlemania 36 night two going to be reviewed uh, tomorrow when i've got uh, a longtime friend of the show matt bayliss and of course top of the leaderboard of the, the brain buster quiz grizz um joining uh, our three-man booth to discuss what will likely be an excellent night to of WrestleMania 36 and if you enjoyed listening to this podcast please don't forget to spread the word tell your friends and tell your family don't forget to hit that ever important subscribe button so that you can be notified every time a new episode drops so uh, thanks again to Kurt thanks to everybody for listening uh, catch up with you all again soon stay safe and have yourself a great week <laughs>